Hi everybody, welcome back to theCUBE's continuous coverage of AWS 2021. This is the biggest hybrid event of the year, the Cube's ninth year covering AWS reInvent. My name is Dave Vellante. Arwar Kadura is here, CUBE alum, Chief Revenue Officer now of Influx Data, and Brian Mullen, who's the Chief Marketing Officer. Folks, good to see you. Thanks for having Arwar, us. great to see you face to face. It's great to meet yeah. you in person, finally. So, so Brian, tell us about Influx Data. People might not be familiar with the company. Sure, yes. Um, Influx Data, we're the company behind a pretty well-known project called uh, InfluxDB. Um, and we're a uh, platform for handling time series data. And so, um, what time series data is, is really, it's any, we think of it as any data that's uh, stamped in time in some way. That could be every second, every two minutes, every five minutes, every nanosecond, whatever it might be. Um, and typically that data comes from, you know, of course, sources. And the sources are, you know, they could be things in the physical world, like devices and sensors, um, you know, temperature gauges, batteries. Um, also things in the virtual world, and you know, uh, software that you're building and running in the cloud. You know, containers, microservices, virtual, virtual machines. So um, all of these, whether in the physical world or the virtual world, are kind of generating a lot of time series data. And our platform's uh, designed specifically to handle that. Yeah, so a lot to unpack here. Our, I mean, I've kind of followed your, since we met on virtually, kind of followed your career. And, and I know when you choose to come to a company, you start with a customer. That's what, that's what you're, that's your, those are your peeps. Absolutely. So what was it that drew you to Influx Data that, that customers were telling you? Yeah, I think what I saw happening from a marketplace is a few paradigm shifts, right? And the first paradigm shift is obviously what the cloud is enabling, right? So everything that we used to take for granted when you know, um, Andreessen Horowitz said you know, software was eating the world, right? And then we moved into apps are eating the world. And now you look at the cloud infrastructure that you know, folks like AWS have empowered, They've allowed um, services like ours and databases and uh, sort of querying capabilities like InfluxDB to basically run at a scale that we never ha would have been able to do um, just sort of with, you know, you host it yourself type of a um, situation. Um, and then the other thing that it's enabled is again, if you go back to sort of database history, relational, right, was humongous, totally transformed what we could do in terms of transactional systems. Then you moved into sort of the, the big data, the Hadoops, the search, right, the elastic. And now what we're seeing is time series is becoming the new paradigm that's enabling a whole set of new use cases um, that have never been enabled before, right? So people that are generating these large volumes of data like Brian talked about, and needing a platform that can ingest millions of points per second, and then the ability to query that in real time in order to take that action, and in order to power things like ML and things like sort of um, you know, autonomous type capabilities, now need this type of capability, okay. so that's ultimately Okay, so it's the, it's, it's the real-timeness, right, is the use cases. Maybe you could talk a little bit more about those use cases and Sure, sure, so, um, yeah, so we have, um, kind of thinking about things as um, uh, both the kind of virtual world where, where uh, people are pulling um, data off of sources that are in infrastructure, software infrastructure. Um, we have a number, like PayPal is a customer of ours, um, and they pull, um, they pull time series data from the infrastructure that runs their payments platform. So you can imagine the volume that they're dealing with um, think about how much data you might have in like a regular relational scenario. Um, now multiply every, that, uh, every piece of data times however often you're looking at it, every one second, every 10 minutes, whatever it might be. You're talking about an order of magnitude, uh, larger volume, higher volume of data. And so the tools that people were using were just not really equipped to handle that kind of volume, um, you, th which is unique to, to time series. Um, so we have uh, customers like PayPal, um, uh, in kind of the uh, software infrastructure side. We also have uh, quite a bit of um, activity among customers on the IoT side. So Tesla is a customer. They're pulling uh, telematics and battery data off of the vehicle, pulling that back, uh, back into their cloud, um, their cloud platform. Uh, Nest is also an, a customer. So you're pretty used to seeing you know, uh, connected thermostats in homes. Um, think of all the data that's coming from, from those individual units. And they're, it's all time series data and they're pulling it into their platform using Influx. So that's interesting, so Tesla, let's take that example, they will maybe persist some of the data, maybe not all of it, it's ephemeral, right. and then they'll push some of it back to the cloud, probably a small portion percentage-wise, but it's a huge amount of data, right? Yeah. So if they, they might want to track some anomaly and say, okay, capture every time an animal runs across, you know, and put that right. back into the cloud. So where do you guys fit in that analysis, and what makes you sort of the 
the best platform for time series database. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because it is ephemeral and there are really two, two parts of it. This is one of the reasons that time series is, uh, is such a challenge to handle with, with something that's not really designed to handle it. Um, in the moment, in that, you know, in that minute, in the last hour, you, have, you really want to see all the data. You want all of, all of uh, what's happening and have full context for what's going on and seeing these fluctuations. Um, but then maybe you know, a day later or a week later, you may not care about that level of fidelity and so you, you, you downsample it. You have like a kind of more of a summarized view of what happened in that moment. So being able to kind of toggle between high fidelity and low fidelity, it's a, it's a super hard problem to solve. And so our, 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 uh, our platform, InfluxDB, really allows you to do that. So and, and that is different from relational databases which are great at ingesting but not great at kicking data out. Right. And I think what you're pointing to is in order to optimize these platforms, you have to ingest and get rid of data as quickly as you can. And that is not something that a traditional database can do. So do you, who do you sell to? Who's your ideal customer profile? I mean, it's pretty well, diverse. It, yeah, it, it, so it tends to focus on builders, right? And builders right. is now obviously a much wider audience, right? We used to say developers, right? Highly technical folks that are building applications. Um, and part of what we love about Influx Data is we're not necessarily trying to only make it for the most sophisticated builders, right? We are trying to allow you to build an application with the minimum amount of code and the greatest amount of integrations, right? So really power you to do more with less um, and get rid of unnecessary code or you know, give you that simplicity because for us it's all about speed to market. You want an application, you have an idea of what it is that you're trying to measure or monitor or instrument, right? We give you the tools, we give you the integrations, we allow you to, to work in the IDE that you prefer. We just launched VS Code integration, for example, and that then allows these technical audiences that are solving really hard problems, right, with today's technologies, um, to really take our product to market very quickly. So I want to I want to follow up on that. So the, I like the term builder. It's an AWS kind of popularized yes. that term, uh, but there's sort of two vectors of that. There's the hardcore developers, yeah. very, very technical, but there's also increasingly domain experts that are building data products, and they're more generalists. Mm -hmm. And I, I think you're saying you serve both of those, but you do integrations that maybe make it easier for the latter, mm -hmm. Uh, and of course, if the, if the former wants to go crazy, they can. Is that a right understanding? Yes, absolutely. It is about accessibility and meeting developers where they are. Um, for example, you probably still need a solid technical foundation to use a product like ours, but increasingly, we're also investing in education, in videos, in templates, again, integrations that make it easier for people to, to maybe just bring a visualization layer that they themselves don't have to build. Um, so it is about accessibility, um, but yes, I, obviously with you know builders, their a technical foundation um, is pretty important. But you know, right now we we're at almost 500,000 active instances of InfluxDB sort of being out there in the wild. Um, so that to me shows that it's a pretty wide variety of audiences that are using yeah. us. So you're obviously part of the AWS ecosystem. Um, um, help us understand that partnership they announced today. Uh, of serverless yeah. for Kinesis. Like what does that mean to you? Do you complement that? Is that competitive? Maybe you can address that. Yep. So we're a longtime partner of AWS. Um, we've been a, uh, in the partner network for several years now and um, we think about it in a, in a couple of ways. First, um, it's an important um, uh, channel, go to market channel for us uh, with, our, with our customers. Um, so uh, as you know, like AWS is an ecosystem unto itself. Um, and so many developers, many, many of these builders are building their applications uh, for their own end users um, in, on AWS in, their, uh, in that ecosystem. And so it's important for us to, number one, have an offering that allows them to put Influx on that bill. So we're offered in the marketplace. Um, you, can, you can sign up for and, and purchase and pay for uh, InfluxDB Cloud using, um, or via AWS Marketplace. And then as Arwa mentioned, we have a number of integrations with all the kind of adjacent products and services from uh, Amazon that uh, many of our developers are using. And so uh, when, we, when we think about kind of quote unquote going to uh, where the develop, meeting developers where they are, that's an important part of it. If, if you're an AWS focused um, uh, developer, then we want to give you not only an easy way to pay for and use our product, but also an easy way to integrate it into the, all, the, all the other things that you're using. In, I think it was 2012, might have been 11 on theCUBE, Jerry Chen of Greylock 
we were asking him, do you think AWS is going to move up the stack and develop applications? He said, no, I don't think so. I think they're going to enable developers and builders to, to do that and then they'll compete with the traditional SaaS vendors. And that's proved to be true, at least thus far. You never say never with AWS. But then recently he wrote a piece called Castles on the Cloud. And the premise was essentially that ISVs will build on top of clouds. Yes. And that seems to be what you're doing with InfluxDB. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that. We call it super clouds. That's right. You know, leveraging the, the hundred billion dollars a year that the hyperscalers spend to develop an abstraction layer that solves a particular problem. But yeah. maybe you could describe what that is from your perspective, InfluxDB. Yeah, well, um, increasingly, uh, we, we grew up uh, originally as an open source uh, software company. Yeah, right. People downloaded the uh, download InfluxDB, ran it locally on a laptop, put it up on a server, and um, you know that, that's our kind of origin as a company. But increasingly, what we what we recognize is um, our our customers, our developers, were building on the uh, building in and on the cloud, and so it was really important for us to kind of meet them there. And so we think about, first of all, offering a, a, a product that is um, easily consumed in the cloud um, and really just allows them to essentially hit an endpoint. Um, so with InfluxDB Cloud, they, uh, they really have, don't have to worry about any of the, um, the kind of deployment and operation of a cluster or anything like that. Really, they just, from a usage perspective, just pay for three things. Uh, the first is data in, how much data are you putting in? Um, second is query count, how many queries are you making against? And then third is storage. How much data do you have and how long are you storing it? And really it's a pretty simple, uh, it's a sim pretty simple prep proposition for the developer to um, kind of see and understand what their costs are going to be as they grow their workload. So it's a managed service, is that it right? It is a managed service. Okay, and how do you guys price? Is it kind of so usage based? Total or? usage based, yeah. A again, data ingestion, we've got um, the query count and the storage that Brian talked about. Um, but to your point, back to the sort of what the hyperscalers are doing in terms of creating this global infrastructure that can easily be tapped into, um, we then extend above that, right? We effectively become a platform as a service builder tool. Uh, many of our customers actually use um, Influx Data to then power their own products, which they then commercialize into a SaaS application. Right, we've got customers that are doing, you know, Kubernetes monitoring or DevOps monitoring solutions, right, that monitor, you know, people's infrastructure or web applications or any of those things. We've got people building us into, you know, industrial IoT, such as PTC's ThingWorks, right, where they've developed their own Very platform, cool. yeah. completely backed uh, by our time series database, right? Rather than them having to build everything, we become that key ingredient. And then of course, the fully cloud managed service means that they can go to market that much quicker. Nobody's procuring servers, nobody's managing you know, security patches, any of that, it's all fully done for you. And it scales up beautifully, which is the key. And to some of our customers, they also want to scale up or down, right? They know when their peak hours are or peak times, they need something that can handle that load. So looking ahead to next year, so we, I'm glad AWS decided to do reInvent <laughs> live. Big, you know, yes. it's, it's weird, right? We thought in June at Mobile World Congress we were gonna, it was going to be the gateway to, to returning, but who knows? It's like two steps forward, one step back, one step forward, two steps back, but we're at least moving in the right direction. So what about for you guys, Influx Data, looking ahead for the coming year, Brian, what could we expect? You know, give us a little Sure. Well, um, well, kind of keeping in the theme of meeting developers where they are, we, we want to build out uh, more in the Amazon ecosystem. So more integrations, more kind of um, uh, ease of use for kind of adjacent products. Um, another is just uh, availability. So we've been, um, we're now on uh, actually three clouds um, in, addition, in addition to AWS. Um, we're on uh, Azure and Google Cloud. Um, but now expanding horizontally and, um, and showing up so we ha can meet our customers that are working in Europe, um, expanding into Asia Pacific, which we did earlier this year. And so I think we'll continue to expand the platform uh, globally um, to bring it closer to where our customers are. And I, oh, oh, go ahead, please. And I would say also the hybrid capabilities probably will also be important, right? Some of our customers run certain workloads locally and then other workloads in the cloud, that ability to have that seamless experience regardless, I think is another really critical advancement that we're continuing to invest in so that as far as the customer is concerned, it's just an API endpoint right. and it doesn't matter where they're deploying. So where do they go? Can they download a freebie version? Uh, give, us the, give us the last They go to influxdata.com. Uh, we do have a free account that anyone can sign up for. It's again, fully cloud hosted and managed. Uh, it's a great place 
place to get started, just learn more about our capabilities. Um, and if you're here at AWS reInvent, we'd love to see you as yeah, well. Check it out. All right, guys, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Thank you. Great thank to see you. you. All right, thank you. Awesome. All right, and thank you for watching. Keep it right there. This is Dave Vellante for theCUBE's coverage of AWS reInvent 2021. You're watching the leader in high-tech coverage. <laughs>